But right now, we're going to be doing session number 10. Session number 10, back in springtime. It feels like, it, it feels like a physical shift, like seeing a picture of like, you know, the, the summer thing and then the, the grassy springtime of, of, of today. But this one is, is uh, going to be all about a really cool topic, shadow IT. And uh, it's presented by CeeLo. I'm going to bring onto the stage Steve Locke, CEO of CeeLo. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? Good, Pete. How are you? Really good, mate. So I'm, I'm going to be moderating this session, but uh, I'm going to give Steve a bit of a, a, an intro first and then we'll bring on the, the other panelists because when we do get on, I'll get you to kind of set the scene for, for this topic. Um, so Steve's co-founder and CEO of CLO, he's a chemical engineer by background, but, but surrounded by family that are filled with doctors and medical people. Um, he's, he and his wife, uh, who is his business partner, founded CLO, um, to replace the use of WhatsApp in healthcare and doing lots more too now with it. Um, listen to previous episodes, the episodes of the podcast, episode 153 and 172 to learn more about CLO. So I'm also going to bring onto the stage, Dr. Josh Kate. And John Lambert, that looked really funny backstage. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he played name, so he knows. There he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, that can be one of those backstage jokes. So, uh, <laughs> Dr. Josh Case, Josh Case, and Dr. John Lambert. Uh, it's almost like Sun Up Summit. Yeah, and myself, and you know, which is, uh, so Josh is a junior doctor and software developer, passionate about innovation, global health, entrepreneurship, and teaching doctors to code. Um, he's been on a couple episodes of the podcast. He's he's appeared on all three summits now. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I, go. I, I was thinking before, but chatting how many other people have that privilege, and I'm honoured to be <laughs> on that. I think I think you're the one. I'll have to double check, and I'm sure there's someone who, who might say, "Oh no, I have to." But he's uh, chair, he's moderated two sessions, and now he's uh, speaking in another. And some great insights in the chat too. Thanks for sticking around and providing um, some insights there. And also John, so Dr. John Lambert, no stranger to many, inaugural chief clinical information officer back in the day, New South Wales Health. Uh, he is an experienced intensive care specialist, worked across the hospital and healthcare industries, now chief medical officer at uh, Harrison AI. Also does a bunch of other stuff too. So, um, hey, John, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. Yeah. So, um, look, we're covering the topic of shadow IT and, uh, I, rather than me giving a bit more of a, um, an overview on it, I, I wanted, this topic came about after discussions with Steve and we're talking about a few different issues. Um, it might've been before or after a podcast episode, but it's a topic that I felt was really kind of, um, in front of mind, becoming an emerging issue. So Steve, do you want to talk a little bit more about the concept of shadow IT and where we might go to now? Yeah, no problem. Um. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, great to be on the on the show, and um, thanks again to Pete for putting on such a great event. Um, yeah, really excited to talk about this one. I think um, shadow IT is something that's becoming a, a bit more of a hot topic um, these days. And for those that I guess don't know what shadow IT is, um, simply put, it's when staff go out and find tools to do the job for them when they may not have something that already does it for them or the organization hasn't quite provided the tools that are fit for purpose. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's a lot of examples that we can point to and, and, um, given that we were sort of sponsoring this session, I thought it's useful to point to ours as an example, because really our business is built on shadow IT. Um, the use of WhatsApp, texting, SMS, whatever you call it in a healthcare setting is probably one of the most prevalent cases of shadow IT within the healthcare setting. Um, and that's not because the docs or the nurses or the healthcare staff are purposely going out and around the systems to do the wrong thing. I think it's because they've gone out and they've tried to find solutions that actually solve the problems for them. There's been a few sessions where people have talked about, you know, problem ahead of the solution. And this is a really good example of that. Um, and, and I guess when we look at the CELO platform, um, it's built like a consumer tool. Um, it's, it's got the healthcare compliance and the utility value in terms of healthcare specific features, but it's just as easy to use as SMS or WhatsApp. Um, and that's actually really important when we think about what the clinicians expect now in this day and age, right? They've got some really great consumer tools out there like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, um, you name it. And, and because we've been, we've built, been built on that sort of consumer look and feel, um, we're really proud to say like across our platform. We boast an average 80% natural adoption rate um, within the first 24 hours of implementing the solution, whether that's a 20-person team right up to a 1,000-plus people organizations. 
Um, and so to sort of set the scene of this session, I'm, I'm keen for us to explore um, what shadow IT looks like and I guess not treat it as sort of a negative thing or, or a, um, a risk to an organization, but see it as an opportunity um, and an opportunity to engage with the clinicians that go out and look for these tool to, tools to solve their problems. Um, and then try, try and involve industry in that process as well. And I think Seal is a great example of um, a company that's jumped on the back of a really large shadow IT problem. We've identified it, um, tried to make it fit for purpose, um, and it's really helped us grow. Um, and now the solution uh, being born out of New Zealand's in 15 countries, we've just entered the US. Um, and that's really because we've listened to our users and we've, we've sort of modeled it on that shadow IT, um, I guess, trend. Yeah. And, you know, seeing like how um, Josh, I came across you back in the day with some of the, the stuff that you wrote about in your experiences in a hospital setting. And, um, you know, I guess you've, you've experienced, many, many clinicians have experienced this, but you um, have experienced this firsthand. Tell us a bit about some about your experience of needing to, to I guess, MacGyver some tools in a, in a hospital setting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned in the intro, my background is I'm, I'm a doc, junior doctor. Um, and for those who aren't aware, many junior doctors in Australia and indeed the world um, uh, fall on the sort of administrative tasks in hospitals. You know, a lot of our, um, uh, the reason for our existence in the, in the workforce is to really um, meet administrative need. Um, and uh, having a background in technology and software, when I joined the medical workforce, saw opportunity everywhere for um, tools that could make that sort of administrative workload a lot easier. And over the last couple of years, I've built a series of tools of varying complexity and size um, that are designed to um, assist doctors in meeting that need. I, I really just want to touch on what Steve mentioned there about, um, you know, shadow IT not necessarily being a negative. Of course, there are potential risks associated with it, but I think for all of the fighting entrepreneurs, you know, in this conference and attending who listen to the podcast, that sort of thing, should be really excited by the prospect of shadow IT. And the reason for that is it's a symptom of an unmet need. It's an unmet need in the systems that we work in, and it's an unmet need um, in the marketplace. It, when you have a um, small agency in a large system getting their own, uh, going a long way to either build their own or fire, repurpose their own tools to um, meet their need, I think there's, there's definitely business opportunities there or, or innovation opportunities there. And as part of that, enormous amounts of value that can be unlocked um, when you have uh, that sort of um, grassroots agent collaborating with um, either industry professionals or people in the health system who have the tools to get it done in, in quote unquote, the proper way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and then we go over to John, you know, you've, you've seen it all from every perspective. You've built tools, you've used tools, and you've also managed, I guess, from a governance side of things as well, and then the oversight. Um, so everything in between, you know, I can see from a um, a CTO or a CIO or someone who's controlling technology's perspective within, I say, a hospital setting, this concept of people just bringing stuff in and starting to use it, it's, it's a pretty scary concept. Like there's, there's a lot of kind of, you know, concerns. from your perspective and what you've seen, you know, is this something to be for CTOs and CIOs to be really alarmed about? <laughs> you had to put me on the spot with that last word. <laughs> Everything else was fine until well, I, you, you probably overstated my experience and uh, oversight, but thank you. Um, like all things, uh, the older I get, uh, the more common answer is um, it depends or it's really about balance. And I know those are sort of almost motherhood statements, which is probably going to irritate a few people. But look, I, I have to totally agree that this is the, the reason we have shadow IT is up. In it's very well stated. Um, you know, beautifully put. And in my mind, there are two basic groups of those. One is accessibility. Um, most of the systems um, are historically closed systems. You, know, you can only use them inside the hospital environment. We only have them on our intranet, for instance. They're not available outside the intranet. And getting into that is a bloody nightmare of VPN dongles and all sorts of other things. Um, and so that doesn't reflect the reality of clinical care. Uh, especially medical. I mean, it does apply to nursing and probably more so to allied health, but especially medical because so much of our workforce exists and works outside the physical boundaries mm -hmm. or even the virtual boundaries of a hospital. So all the VMOs, for instance, they've got their own systems. They don't care about the IT systems of the, of the government. Mm -hmm. They're contractors. Um, you have staff specialists who have university appointments. You have residents, res residents and registrars who work in multiple sites. So, you know, this, this I can't get access to the EMR is a really constant frustration. It drives a lot of unmet. Um, 
product. The second unmet need, and I think this will always exist no matter how brilliant our emails become in 100 years' time. Um, <laughs> no offence, but anyway. I, think, I, I see what you did. This is in it. Specific workflow support and innovation. Um, the um, No matter how good the email is, there will always be somebody's workflow that you don't quite support as beautifully as some other niche app that somebody's built or some innovative idea that some RMO has come up with and turned into something really great. So I think those two unmet needs will always exist. On the other side of the coin, government has to worry about privacy, confidentiality, safety, security, authentication, access control, audit, and record. And that turns into some amazing acronym that I haven't quite worked out yet. <laughs> um, but it'll be amazing once I work it out. But, you know, these are not to be laughed about. These are not to be dismissed easily. And, um, and of course, you know, there's legal issues of discoverability. You know, it's, it's really fascinating, but a lot of people don't appreciate that the state is governed by a state records act, but private practicing specialists are not governed by that act. So there's an act that says any any uh, annotational record or anything written, especially, but it's it's written, written in better words than I'm saying right now, has to be um, available for access, you know, seven years after the patient's so discharge date or seven years from the age at which they turn, I think 21, it might be, might be 18. Sorry about the details, I'm not the lawyer. But, you know, they have to abide by that. And a lot of the content we're talking about in these apps would probably be viewed mm -hmm. as discoverable and needs to be rewarded somewhere. So how do you manage those two tensions? And look, uh, one of my other hats, uh, I do actually work for another sponsor of this session, which is Genie. Um, and they're addressing that um, in part through the Genie marketplace, which is the idea is that you have a controlled ecosystem supported by appropriate APIs, usually Firebase nowadays, and Fire has made all of this logistically and technically much more possible, where you have, you know, and you might have different tiers of trust. So some organizations are deeply trusted and connected deep into the system. Others really only get a very hands off. You might get a, you know, a list of patients if that. Um, and you can have some sort of control over those eight key things you have to control whilst allowing the innovation. Um, look, the final barrier, I have to be honest, and this probably um, affected Steve in particular, um, is internal competition with approved solutions where you've got a product that is a direct competition with the government or the, it doesn't have to be government. It can be a big private organization. These issues occur everywhere. Um, they have their thing that they want people to use and it might not be as slick and it might not be as clean and it might not be as a usable and sexy. However, it does adhere to the privacy, confidentiality, safety, security, authentication, access control, audit, and record requirements of the organization yeah. which supersede everything else. So you can see how these um, decisions get made. I have sympathy and empathy for both sides of the coin. Um, it was one of my things that I attempted to try and improve on when I was in the CCI role at New South Wales Health. I don't think I did as good a job as I wanted to, but um, you know, I, I think there are ways of addressing it and getting that balance right. Um, some organisations have done that better than others. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answer helps at all. Though. No, no. Look, and, and and I think about you know some of my own experiences as a vendor, and you know working with you know particularly in New South Wales on my side, but it could be in any any state, or I guess even more broadly in an institution kind of thing where you've got the um, particularly in healthcare, you've got um, normally federation and states kind of running their own thing, but then you've also got someone like eHealth or like a body that also looks over it too. So when you're talking about not just internal competition of solutions that exist there's a lot obviously a lot of kind of work that goes on in a in a um, hospital setting that means you know there could be advocates kind of you know at the start and using the solution but potentially there's not um agreements all the way through the, the pipeline to get that you know steve from your experience south wales adds that multi-dimensionality yeah, yeah. complexity you know where there's 30 parties that all want something different right? sorry yeah no, it's interesting. And so, Steve, from your side, you know, have, have you been able to navigate these kind of things successfully and worked out ways that um, could help other vendors in trying to do this or uh, overall help the industry lift and try and find some more innovative solutions? Yeah, I think um, in a way, probably like if we look at the Australia example um, specifically, um, big organisations like eHealth um, and, and I guess these government-led organisations that have this red tape we like to call it, um, it almost forces your hand around what you have to do, right? So mm -hmm. as a as a fast moving SaaS product, um, we can't wait for approvals. You know, we, we need users, we need numbers, we need revenue. We just gotta keep the dial moving. So we get creative around how we do that. And so 
when the standards don't exist at like a state level or a, or a e-health level or a, or, or the sort of intermediary um, powers of B, I guess you could call it, we go over and above that and we say, okay, what other accreditations are out there? And we go for as much gold standard accreditation we, as we can achieve. Mm. And so for us, if we ever look at our um, accreditations now, we, you know, we've got 20 plus global accreditations and, um, you know, compliance certificates and testing and third party auditors and all these things in every market that we enter, which we use as sort of a, I guess, a starting point to try and reduce that gap to getting the approval within the organizations that use our tool. And so when we look at our specific example, we, you know, we're replacing something that's completely not sanctioned at all. Um, and so although it might not be, um, officially endorsed by eHealth New South Wales, um, uh, you know, caveat to that is we're actually on New South Wales BY, which is another government, um, program, um, and they have an, another set of standards you go through. Um, and then of course, when we go into an LHD, then they have their own set of standards and they also want another risk assessment done, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, it becomes, I guess, a, a little bit of an overhead that you don't always want to navigate. So for us, it's okay, give people some peace of mind about what accreditations we do have mm. and let them move to something that is a lot safer than what they're currently doing and give them that, that, that assurance. Mm. And then when the organization's ready to engage with us, that's the point in time they can take that shadow IT that's got really good engagement and, and, and stickiness and utility value within the organization. And actually then we're happy to work with them and say, okay, how are we going to work together to make this organizationally safe and sound for you guys? Um, and that's a big point of difference compared to using something like WhatsApp, right? Like if they, if, if, let's take Sydney RHD as an example, they ring up WhatsApp and say, hey guys, we'd love to work with you guys to make this a safe tool within our organization. They're probably not going to get that buy in yeah. to actually go through the steps and do it. So I think I would, from an organizational point, point of view, I guess I would see it as an opportunity to work with the vendors that are embracing shadow IT, developing into something that probably has a little bit more structure around it. And then maybe that can, um, I think there was some comments around closing the gap, um, from David Ryan in the chat, but, um, that's kind of where I see it heading to, heading to, I'd love to get your view on that, that Josh, um, yeah. from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to, um, you know, one, one particular example, probably the biggest practice of shadow IT that I've been involved in was the very first version of this tool that automated this task that, um, this very painful administrative task that junior doctors would have in the morning. It took me about five hours to make. Um, and we now, I guess, sort of, um, how many months, about nine months, 10 months into the, um, process of sort of um, officializing it, should we say. And I think I posted in the Talking Health Tech community about 10 months ago saying that it was two weeks away from finishing. I think that was a little bit optimistic. Um, so I guess, you know, that's, that's just to paint a picture of how, how hard it can be to get from, um, you know, uh, uh, concept to actually delivering value in a, in an official way. Um, and that point that David Ryan made about, um, uh, you know, really I guess, latching onto not pumping my own tires, but people like me who have identified an unmet need and are committed to making change about that. Really, I think organizations would do well to have very clearly defined pathways to kind of sink their teeth into me and, um, you know, help me get it to the next stage and have clear frameworks for doing so. I think that would go a long way in doing that. Steve, just touching on what you mentioned before, I'm very interested to know if you just spoke a lot about um, pursuing accreditations and that kind of thing. How does, you know, you, you know, healthcare is typically, you know, um, a very defensive industry and we're all about regulation and so forth. Has getting those accreditation certificates been the, the um, assurance that decision makers need to say, okay, you are legitimate? Have you seen a noticeable um, and tangible amount of traction that you get from saying, okay, I've got my ISO 27001 or, or whatever alternative um, accreditation? Has that given you the bang for the buck that you were hoping for? Yeah, I think so. Over time, we've seen that anyway, because it's, yeah, it's, you know, as a one man band, it's really hard to cheat yeah, those standards. So you, yeah. you need to be at a point where you, where you can actually spend the time and, and meet those standards, um, at a consistent level, you know, o over and over again, every time you go and look at these standards, you're meeting them. And mm -hmm. if you keep adding them, it, it gives that sense of actually, um, this is, this is something that is being taken seriously and it, it always kind of made or surprised me i guess when organizations were like oh are you sure you've thought about um you know whether you're keeping the data safe and it's like man like let's look at the 
and uh, the, the sort of traction we've got. Let's look at the investors that are on board. Um, you know, there's probably been so many rounds of due diligence that there's probably the sense of like, okay, it's, it's a young company, young founders. Um, maybe they're just like throwing it all together and hope for the best. And I think we've probably got to like, um, I guess, get rid of that, um, you know, expect the worst, hope for the best kind of mentality and, yeah. and, and maybe try and create some frameworks and standards for the, for the, um, for the organizations of some of these innovators to actually go through and say, okay, we can tick all these boxes. And then that gives the organization some reassurance. And I guess, yeah. John, you touched on that marketplace that you were talking about. Um, you know, it's, it's, well, it's one approach. Like I'm to lead. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've, they've got a few less constraints on them to be fair. So that's the other thing. It's much easier to be agile in a private setting than a, than a public setting, especially if you're not publicly listed even. Um, but just to one of your points, um, the standards that you were talking about and all the compliances you mentioned, um, it's surprising how many even big companies don't meet all of those. So mm-hmm. don't feel that it's just yep. because you're small in a startup and everybody thinks that you know nothing. Um, and secondly, unfortunately, that is the minimum standard to play. So I, I do get a lot of companies say, but we meet all these standards. I'm saying that is brilliant because if we hadn't, we wouldn't even be talking. That's the beginning. Let's go from there. It's not, oh, I meet all these standards, so therefore I can just work. You know, it, it, it's, it's sadly, that's, that's also one of the realities. And, and I totally agree. It's a lot of hard work to meet all those compliances as well. Um, which is tough for a smaller company. Hey, just addressing some of the questions in the chat and the comments, and I think we've done that as we've spoken too, and this kind of covers on um, the similar point but different that Michelle's brought up about is it possible for big organisations and government to keep up with IT developments? I guess it's similar to the conversation around can regulation keep up with uh, development too? Does anyone have some um, thoughts and perspectives on that? You said the magic word. You said can. Of course it can. <laughs> can I? <laughs> <Right? laughs> What's the motivator exactly? So yeah. uh, who, who, ha- who suffers the pain here? And is that pain enough for them to change? I mean, we all know the rule about change. People only change when the pain of staying the same is, is worse than the pain of changing. Um, and that's really brutally what you've got to look at. Yeah. I think um, I just add piggybacking on that, um, John, you know, I think um, if we define keeping up with te- technology developments as in um, uh, implementing them, you know, contemporaneously sort of as they come out, the answer is a hard no. And the reason for that is um, there will always be an inherent lag, one, due to regulation and two, due to the enormous amount of change management. So to say, will they be able to keep up with? No. Will we be able to build systems that can systematically kind of chase developments? Well, maybe. Um, I think that's something we have a better chance at doing than sort of having, you know, um, BI bubbles in the hospital ward a month after they're released, for example, you know, um, I think that's a more of a realistic outcome than hospitals being the bleeding edge everywhere all the time. <laughs> the, strange, the strange thing is that people often say, oh, oh the reason it slows is because medicine is such a slow and conservative, you know, industry. Is it? Like, we are goggles in the operating theatre assisting neurosurgeons. Yeah, that's yeah. happening. You know, yes. there's, some of these technologies that we actually use on patients get into the hospital 10 years faster than yes. these IT systems that are, that are, you know, in some respects, administrative. You know, and you think, why is that? That's just madness. Um, but it's partly because the person prepared to pay for it is the person feeling the pain. Like the residents feeling pain may not be a signal for decision makers that have to spend lots of money to solve that problem. And that's, I'm um, being a bit brutal about it perhaps, but that is sometimes the barrier. Yeah. No, so often. And that's um, that so many different stakeholders involved and, and you're right about change. Look, guys, we are going to need like in final thoughts in terms of this session and uh, like all of these, we could have them for much longer, but we'll, we've just scratched the surface. But if we were to leave with a few final thoughts, I might go around the room, um, perhaps opening up with Steve and then Josh and then John. Yeah. So probably only one, one real point for me is, is um, for the organizations that are seeing the shadow IT um, embrace it have a look at what it actually is and what problem, what problem it solves and, um, make sure that you're spending enough time at the coal face with your clinicians that are needing these tools. And Josh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Steve, I completely agree with what you're saying. And this, John, this bizarre dichotomy between super advanced robotics in surgery and then administrative processes that makes you want to pull your hair out are really bizarre, isn't it? Um, look, I think, you know, there's a massive amount of opportunity to unlock with these types of tools. There's no point denying it or trying to outlaw it because it happens in every health service at every level from JMO right through to consultable, right through to, cons- to administrative staff. It's everywhere. You have to embrace it. You have to roll with it and you have to leverage the benefits over the risks. I think. 
this feels a bit like a pile on, but like, yeah, if, <laughs> it's great that three people from such different perspectives all agree so profoundly on something, but I'm going to go on a really positive note because I actually feel it's not about competition or fear or anything like that. It's in my opinion, the only way we are going to succeed is with the jurisdictionally heavy and governance heavy public sector organizations to partner with the agility, innovation, and speed of startups and companies like Steve's and others um, to do all the tricky, fun stuff, I guess, uh, and plug those two together somehow. And if we can't work out a way of leveraging that power, and don't forget it's often heavily funded by venture capitalists to tune way beyond what the health department would ever give to an innovation program. Uh, if we can't connect that with the, with the big bulk of the system, I fear for the future. I honestly feel it is the best way to proceed. So I, I'm, I'm gunning for it. I'm doing everything I can to try and help it. You know, um, let me know if I can help in any way. But I, I really do think that's how we will succeed in the long term. No, look, I think conversations like these and getting the the issues out there and sharing that amongst those that are, are not just impacted by but can make decisions around it. So we'll make we'll put this episode as a um, um, a session on the podcast in the future too. I think that the the topics that we've covered in it are good and really pertinent to to healthcare today and to um, many decision makers in the space. So look, Steve, John, Josh, thank you so much for making the time and please join us for the other sessions as well. Thank you, Pete.